Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the arrival of Her Excellency, the Right Honorable Mikhail Jean, Canada's 27th Governor General. Her Excellency will be accompanied by President Peter McKinnon. Please be seated. I would now like to invite President Peter McKinnon to welcome Her Excellency and bring greetings on behalf of the University of Saskatchewan. Thank you uh, very much, Heather. Welcome, everyone. I'm very, very proud this morning to welcome Her Excellency the Right Honourable Mikhail Jean, Canada's 27th Governor General, to our beautiful campus and to this room, Convocation Hall, with its history as a gathering place where people come together to talk, to listen, and to celebrate. Today we continue that history as our tribute to the 50th anniversary of Canada's Bill of Rights is inaugurated by an official visit from Her Excellency, the Governor General. That we celebrate this historic achievement here at the University of Saskatchewan is fitting, as the Right Honourable John G. Diefenbaker, former Prime Minister of Canada, University of Saskatchewan alumnus, and former Chancellor, led in the pursuit of Canada's Bill of Rights. John Diefenbaker was also present for two other firsts in Canadian history. In 1950, Ellen Fairclough became the first woman elected to the House of Commons. Diefenbaker followed this with her appointment to cabinet in 1957, becoming the first Canadian Prime Minister to appoint a woman to cabinet. Our campus is fortunate to be home to the Diefenbaker Canada Centre, repository of the former Prime Minister's papers and personal effects. And the Centre will launch a special exhibit celebrating the anniversary of the Bill of Rights on September the 10th, which I hope that many of you or all of you can attend. At the University of Saskatchewan, we want to enhance our students' learning and life experiences, offering freedom and support so that bright minds can push the boundaries of knowledge, reach across disciplines into our communities, 
and around the world to work and think differently about the issues of our time. Over the 100 plus years of our history, the people of this university have applied their determined spirits and diverse perspectives and supported each other in achieving cutting edge understanding of human and other living systems. We've gained globally recognized and respected results in areas as diverse as Parkinson's disease, crop science, Aboriginal and newcomer relations, water and toxicology research, vaccinology to name just a few. And today, Your Excellency, you toured one of the signature facilities located on our campus, Canada's only synchrotron, the Canadian light source. With facilities like this and with the new International Vaccine Centre that we passed by just moments ago, we are doing our part to develop our country's research capacity. Madam Jean, as an accomplished and award-winning scholar and journalist, you have dedicated your professional life to human rights, to gender equity. Your presence here today, Your Excellency, is therefore particularly meaningful as we gather to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Canadian Bill of Rights. Your Excellency, on behalf of our Chancellor, on behalf of the Board of Governors and those of us here today, thank you so much for sharing this special occasion with us and welcome to the University of Saskatchewan. Thank you, President McKinnon. At this time, the University of Saskatchewan is pleased to make a presentation to Her Excellency. I'd like to invite Elders Maria and Walter Linklater and Joan Gray Eyes, Special Advisor to the President on at Aboriginal Initiatives for the University of Saskatchewan, to please come forward. Your Excellency, would you please come forward to accept a gift and uh, a blessing and presentation. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Walter Linklater. I'm very honored to, to be here this morning. We welcome Her Excellency to Treaty Number Six. And as part of that uh, welcoming ceremony, traditionally, she will be given a blanket. Joan will present, uh, and Maria will present her with a blanket. The blanket symbolizes the power of woman. Also, it's the traditional way of uh, accepting another guest in our land. And it also emphasizes the uh, unification of all people through the practicing of the positive value systems that First Nations espouse, such as honesty, kindness, love. That you will carry these with you wherever you go, and the blanket will protect you and protect us all as one. This morning in a private ceremony, we bless the blanket traditionally as well. So you're in good hands with the great spirit. <laughs> <laughs> also, part of our gift, traditional oral gift, is the giving of a name. So we will bestow the name upon her, Kichi Ogma Ekwe. Kichi Ogma Ekwe. I'll write that down for you later. <laughs> <laughs> Which means in English, great woman who leads. Great woman who leads.
<laughs> Thank you. Nanaskumanamotsi <laughs> So it and the Matsun and Gagini Hagani Tawia, Nigi Hunanak. We chain and Katoa, Kasoin Gosia, Nanaskomana, Yogi Wotse. Hi, hi. Je ne sais pas si je vais vous le donner. Je ne suis pas sûre. J'ai besoin de la protection. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Chancellor, Mr. President, distinguished guests, chers amis, I could not ask for a kinder or more fortifying protection than this beautiful blanket, which uh, the elders have so graciously presented to me and given me as I begin my address this morning. And it's always uh, really a pleasure to hear the blessing words in uh, an Aboriginal language because it is uh, a powerful connection to this legacy, to, uh, to you, the first peoples who represent our deepest roots in this land. Thank you very much. I feel blessed. It is a precious gift, a very precious gift. And you know, since we are focusing uh, on women's rights today, let me begin by honoring all the women who have made me the woman you see standing before you, starting by uh, my grandmother, a widow with five children, living in the, the poorest country in the Americas, Haiti. She made gaining self-sufficiency, obtaining financial independence, and providing greater educational opportunities for her children, key priorities. And she did that working tirelessly, day in and day out, behind a sewing machine to support her children. She was perhaps visionary in recognizing that the emancipation of women is inextricably linked to our ability to be self-sufficient and autonomous. My mother inherited and lived this philosophy by leading an incessant struggle for human rights, freedom and justice in Haiti, as well as by undertaking a literacy campaign throughout the beleaguered country. And because of her resistance against dictatorship and oppression, 
she, along with uh, my uh, sister, was forced to flee to Canada, where she raised her own children alone by inculcating us with the power to never allow ourselves to be bitten down by the hard circumstances of life. Never. To have confidence in ourselves, always. And most importantly, to recognize that education is the key to freedom, like her mother always told her. As a teenager and young adult, I too became socially engaged by joining the inspiring women of Quebec's feminist movement. Women of all backgrounds, educators, intellectuals, working class women, immigrant and refugee women, indigenous women, with whom I fought for the recognition of women's rights. It was with them that I helped establish a network of over 150 emergency shelters for battered women and their children. It was also from these women, women whom I accompanied in their efforts to escape domestic violence and to take back their lives with strength and vigor, that I learned how to reflect and how to take action. Then, of course, there are all the women I met during my visits across Canada and abroad, in countries across Africa, across the Americas, across Europe, in Afghanistan, and China. Women all very courageous, who are the pillars of the global struggle for justice, respect, and solidarity. These are the women who have made me who I am, for which I am forever grateful. The discussion that brings us together today, the theme of which um, is stated uh, unhesitatingly, like uh, an assertion, is one I have led all across the country and around the world over the last five years as Governor General of Canada, with your support. This assertion which uh, stipulates that women's rights are human rights, are one in the same, women's rights and human rights. It is in fact one of my deepest convictions and in my opinion sine qua non to the advancement of our societies. Therefore I want to start by saying that human rights are inconceivable if they exclude over half the human population. I have always believed that ignoring the plight of women is not only an inexcusable lack of responsibility, but also an unjustifiable crime against humanity. This is a good and much needed opportunity for us to remember that August 10th marks the 50th anniversary of uh, September 10th of uh, the Canadian uh, Bill of Rights by the government of Prime Minister John Diffenbaker who said at the time history shows that if you permit the rights of a citizen to be impinged upon regardless of who the citizen may be, every other person is a step nearer to a loss of his or her rights. That is why, to continue Diffen Baker's thought, we must extol above all the dignity and freedom of every human being. And it is this idea that contributed to the adoption of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms 1982. Driven by their conviction that human rights are inalienable, 
groups of women, aboriginals, francophones, and anglophones, ethnic and racial minorities, and people of different religions have all worked together to demand that the fundamental rights and freedoms of all Canadians be respected and protected without distinction. Many groups encompassing women, men, and youth have told me that they believe this democratic principle cannot be dis dissociated from the Canada they love, the Canada they want to see shine on the world stage. Parce que de la pleine reconnaissance des droits des femmes dépend la pertinence et la vitalité de nos démocraties. Quand les femmes réclament plus de justice, c'est pour que l'ensemble de la société, et je dirais de l'humanité, vive en sécurité et profite de la contribution de chacune et de chacun. Quand les femmes luttent contre la pauvreté, c'est pour que nos enfants mangent à leur faim et aient des conditions de vie plus décentes. Quand les femmes dénoncent la violence, comme nous le rappelle tragiquement l'affaire Picton, qui défraie les manchettes ces jours-ci, sans en oublier les nombreux cas de violence conjugale et les nombreux cas aussi des femmes disparues de Saskatchewan et d'ailleurs au pays, c'est pour que nos familles et nos communautés soit des milieux de vie sains et respectueux de la dignité de chacune et de chacun. Quand les femmes se démènent pour envoyer leurs enfants à l'école, filles et garçons, c'est pour faire progresser les leurs, c'est pour faire progresser leur communauté, leur pays et le monde entier. Quand les femmes combattent l'oppression et dénoncent au péril de leur vie, très souvent, cette oppression, c'est pour que tous les êtres humains, hommes et femmes, accèdent à la liberté. Or, donnez du pouvoir aux femmes et vous verrez reculer les inégalités, vous verrez reculer la misère, la maladie, la barbarie, l'analphabétisme et la tyrannie. Et je ne me lasse pas de le répéter, tellement cette affirmation me semble aller de soi. Et c'est confirmé partout où je suis allée au Canada, dans les Caraïbes, en Amérique centrale et du Sud, en Europe, en Afrique et en Asie. Donner du pouvoir aux femmes, c'est donner du pouvoir à toute une nation. The relevance and vitality of our democracies depend on the full recognition of women's rights. When women demand more justice, it is so that society as a whole benefits from the contribution of every member. When women fight against poverty, it is so that our children have enough food to eat and more decent living conditions. When women stand up to violence, as we are also tragically reminded by the Picton affair, which is dominating the headlines these days, but also by the missing women of Saskatchewan and the rest of the country, and by the ongoing trafficking of women, as well as by the many honor killings, by domestic violence. It is so far, it is so that our families and communities can be a safe refuge where individual dignity is respected, human dignity. Where we, when women fight to send their children both girls and boys, to school. It is to move their families, their communities, their country, and the entire world forward. When women combat oppression and risk their lives to denounce it, it is so that every human being, men or women, can live in freedom. Empower women, and you will see a decrease in inequality misery, disease, barbarism, illiteracy, and tyranny. And I never miss an opportunity to repeat this. So obvious this assertion seems to me. 
and I have seen it confirmed everywhere I have gone. Empower women, you empower community. Empower women, you empower country. Empower women, you empower a nation. We must not forget that women's rights, which we take for granted far too often these days, are a relatively new development in the history of our country and are therefore still quite fragile. Indeed, we must not forget that it was not until the beginning of the last century that we obtained the right to vote in Canada. In Quebec, it was not until 1940. And for Aboriginal women, it was not until 1960. And as Simone de Beauvoir wrote, to set oneself free is also to seek freedom for others. And that, I believe, is the true meaning and the incredible power of discussions like the one we are having today. This is the reason why I will be also hosting in Ottawa at Rideau Hall on September 9th a two-day conference on the crucial issue of women and security. The security of women is still an issue in this country today. And there are still too many cases of violence that remain untold and unresolved. Speaking out is refusing to close yourself off and live in sterile silence. Speaking out is spreading all around us the freedom we hold so dear in Canada, freedom that is so cruelly lacking in too many places around the world. Speaking out is adding another link to the chain of solidarity rather than to the chain of subjugation. And uh, that is why, dear friends, I cannot wait to hear from you. And uh, why I too am delighted that the defense of women's rights is no longer the concern of only a few, but is today the object of mobilization that increasingly transcends genders, ages, and cultures. And this, we will all agree, and I believe, is a great sign of hope. And now the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup, merci infiniment. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for that wonderfully inspiring and thought-provoking address. It's my pleasure now to introduce our four panelists, each of whom will have five minutes to discuss one aspect of uh, Her Excellency's address. Um, following their presentations, the audience will have an opportunity to ask questions of our panelists. And uh, to begin, I'd like to introduce to you Beth Bilson, our first panelist, Acting Dean, College of Law at the University of Saskatchewan. Beth has degrees in law and history from the U of S and a doctoral degree in law from the University of London. She's been a faculty member of the College of Law at the University of Saskatchewan since 1979, teaching and writing in the areas of torts, labor and administrative law and legal history. Beth has served as Assistant Dean of Law, Assistant Vice President Administration for our university, um, as well as the Chair of the Saskatchewan Labor Relations Board and the Dean of the College of Law. In addition to acting as a labor arbitrator in Saskatchewan, she's a member of the Law Society of Saskatchewan and a part-time member of the Public Service Labor Relations Board and of the Yukon Public Service Labor Relations Board. She serves as a deputy chair of the Discipline Committee of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Saskatchewan. She was appointed in 2000 as chair of a federal task force on pay equity, which reported in 2004. Since 2006, Beth has been editor of the Canadian Bar Review. She recently stepped down as chair of the Standing Committee on Equity of the Canadian Bar Association and the Equity Committee of the Canadian Bar Association Saskatchewan branch. Beth was awarded the designation of Queen's Council for Saskatchewan in January of 2000 and the Cecilia F. Johnstone Award from the Canadian Bar Association in 2010. Welcome, Professor Bilson. Uh, thanks, Heather. 
and uh, I'd like to add my welcome to Her Excellency to the University of Saskatchewan. As you can tell from Heather's introduction, I've been here a long time. <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, begin by giving you a three-minute course in recent constitutional history, and I do that conscious that there's one current and one former Chief Commissioner of the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission in the audience this morning. Um, without wishing to upstage John Diefenbaker, um, I'd like first to allude to a, an event that took place in Saskatchewan in 1947, which was that the Saskatchewan government passed the first Bill of Rights in Canada. Um, this was a period following the Second World War when there was, was uh, significant consciousness of uh, the dangers that were present uh, when, uh, when people's civil liberties and human rights were ignored. And the government of Saskatchewan um, was very cognizant of that and passed the first Bill of Rights, which uh, it's really set the pattern for uh, future human rights legislation and constitutional uh, enactments in Canada in the sense that it, it included not only uh, reference to the sort of fundamental freedoms, the idea of fundamental freedoms like freedom of expression, but it also recognized that discrimination was an infringement of people's human rights. That is to treat people as less than equal uh, was an infringement of their human rights. Uh, the Saskatchewan Bill of Rights, oddly enough, did not contain any reference to gender. <laughs> um, the protection that was offered under that Bill of Rights was on the basis of other categories like religion and ethnic origin. Um, the the Diefenbaker Bill of Rights, as we know, was passed in 1960. Um, the 19, late 1960s and 1970s saw the enactment in all Canadian provinces and the territories of human rights legislation, provincial human rights legislation, and the formation of human rights commissions as a vehicle for um, considering how to advance the principles of human rights legislation. Uh, and then, of course, in 1981, uh, a constitutional accord uh, was, was reached with respect to the repatriation of the Canadian Constitution, uh, and that accord included uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which um, was uh, supported by not only the federal government, but by uh, all provincial governments as well as part of the Constitutional Accord. Um, the, the, I think that the, the Diefenbaker Bill of Rights, which it, it, the Bill of Rights is often referred to, um, has, has often been denigrated as something which didn't have much significance, or at least that it, no one um, followed up with it very much. It was not the subject of much litigation. Uh, there really was no mechanism provided, specific mechanism provided for enforcing it, other than uh, actions through the courts. Um, but I think that I think the significance of that Bill of Rights should not be lost. Uh, first of all, it was an, a national statement about human rights principles. Um, the first uh, sort of 20th century um, statement by the national government of its commitment to the principles of human rights. And the other thing, which may be of more importance to lawyers than other people, <laughs> Um, was that it actually gave the decision makers, um, including the courts, an opportunity to uh, begin to talk in terms of human rights principles, to be in, begin to articulate the kinds of principles that have become so important in the last quarter of the 20th century and up to now. In the nearly 30 years now since the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was proclaimed, um, there has been an enormous uh, focus, not only in the courts, but in public discourse, uh, in the discourse of governments, in the discourse of institutions and organizations uh, concerning human rights. That is, there. I think that the effect of the Charter has been to uh, establish a, a foundation for 
a discussion of human rights and a discussion of how to advance uh, the cause of uh, equality and the protection of people's uh, rights and freedoms. Um, and, and I think that that discussion has been very important. Um, the, the, the Supreme Court of Canada has been one of the leading forces, of course, but that's not the only place where the discussion has gone on or where the principles have been refined and elaborated. Um, one of the things that I think uh, has been an important theme uh, in, in, in the first, from the first um, intimations that, uh, that discrimination should be prohibited and, th and that equality is an important basis for Canadian society, but particularly since the enactment of the Charter, uh, one of the things that I think people have gradually uh, come to realize is that you can't simply enact legislation or even embed, as the Charter does, embed the principles of equality and human rights in a constitutional form, that you actually have to find some way of bringing those principles to life that you have to find some way of making them alive in the, in the day-to-day -day, um, encounters and experiences that people have in Canadian society. Now, one of the, one of the, the impetus um, behind uh, the development of that kind of discussion was the, 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 the statement from the, uh, from the federal government um, and from the Supreme Court of Canada that it's important that equality not simply be formal equality, that is the idea that everyone, you know, that there's a statement that everyone is equal, but that every employer, every in institution, every union, every government be thinking of ways to bring those principles to life in whatever people are doing at work or in school or wherever they they are in their lives. So I think that that's, um, that's the, the, the flavor of the constitutional developments that have occurred. And of course, they have been of enormous significance to women, among other groups in Canadian society. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> I'd now like to introduce to you our next panelist, Pamela Jordan, Associate Professor in the Department of History at the University of Saskatchewan. Professor Jordan teaches courses on genocide, intelligence, espionage, and the Cold War. She has taught core courses for the International Studies Program as well. Her scholarly publications include Defending Rights in Russia, Lawyers, the State, and Legal Reform in the Post-Soviet Era, as well as articles on human rights topics and Russian foreign policy in numerous academic journals, such as er Europe Asia Studies, Human Rights Quarterly, American Journal of Comparative Law, the Journal of Com Communist Studies and Transition Politics, and African Studies Quarterly. In addition to her academic work, she has served as Executive Director of the NGO Committee on Disarmament, an organization that facilitates contacts between non-governmental organizations in the field of disarmament and the United Nations New York City, and as a consultant for the American Bar Association and USIA and US aid-funded projects concerning civil society and legal reform in Russia. Welcome, Pamela. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here today to speak on a topic that is so close to uh, the heart of Your Excellency. And I'm going to be focusing on um, the topic of empowerment of women on the global scale. Empowerment refers to the ability of women as individuals and on a collective basis to improve their economic, health, political, and social status. Empowerment also requires the removal of obstacles to change, such as sexist attitudes and gender-based violence. It's now well established through international law that women's rights are human rights. Several UN declarations and platforms for action, including the one that was adopted in 1995, 15 years ago in Beijing, at the Fourth World Conference for Women, 
uh, legally binding conventions, including the 1979 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, Security Council resolutions, and Millennium Development Goals have been adopted to advance women's and girls' rights. They offer a solid, normative framework on which to build, but without pragmatic leadership, expanded uh, educational opportunities for women and girls, and more targeted funding by donors, these UN measures will prove to be ineffective. Despite many significant advancements for women in Western countries, women's right leaders, such as Your Excellency, are still needed to promote gender equality. The macro level statistics are grim. Women represent approximately 70% of the world's poor. Women and children make up approximately 70% of casualties in recent violent conflicts, and they are the victims of violence in the form of torture, domestic abuse, honor killings, and forced prostitution. Even in Canada, a large number of single mothers live below the poverty line. So when we advocate for gender equality and empowering girls and women, we are working to save lives and to end the feminization of poverty. In response to this evidence and the strong advocacy work of women in developing countries, many development agencies and human rights groups, including CETA, the Canadian International Development Agency, and Oxfam Canada, have now designed programs to help empower women and girls and close the gender gap in terms of access to education, healthcare, employment, and political decision making. For his part, UN General Secretary Ban Ki-moon stresses that, quote, equality for women and girls is not only a basic human right, it is a social and economic imperative. Where women are educated and empowered, economies are more productive and strong. Where women are fully represented, societies are more peaceful and stable. Unquote. In fact, I see that there's already room for hope. The authors of the World Economic Forum's Gender Gap Report of 2009 found that since 2006, more than two-thirds of countries in the rating have improved their performance. Recent findings on the status of women throughout the world provide some encouraging news as well about women's and girls' empowerment. For instance, according to the UN, the gender gap in primary school employment in developing countries has narrowed to over 95 girls for every 100 boys, which represents a 4% uh, increase since 1999. In Kabul, Afghanistan, Sakina Yakubi runs the Afghan Institute of Learning, which provides educational and other services for thousands of women and girls in Afghanistan. In China, women own 40% of businesses. According to one international development researcher, Maggie Black, in Bangladesh, women garment workers now enjoy a status and bargaining position they never had enjoyed before. In terms of microloans, Women's World Banking, uh, which is a global network of 40 microfinance providers and banks, demonstrated that, quote, when given access to financial services and information, poor women are reliable borrowers and dynamic entrepreneurs whose economic empowerment will lead to higher standards of living across communities. In the breakaway Republic of Somaliland, Edna Aden, a qualified nurse midwife and former WHO World Health Organization official, built a maternity hospital with her own savings and donations from supporters around the world. Moreover, in several other post-conflict countries, including Liberia, which is the home of Africa's first elected national female leader, and Rwanda, where at least half the legislators are women, women are playing a more active role in politics. So in conclusion, the roadmap to empowerment needs to be drawn by women on the local level in order to address their distinct needs and interests. But Canadians can further their cause by donating to reputable charities like Oxfam Canada 
and by letting our MPs know that Canada needs to invest further in the empowerment of women and girls here and abroad. Also, the cancellation of all third world debt would allow governments to allocate more of their budgets to education, health healthcare, and other critical social services that would benefit women and girls. As our Governor General has said, I have seen proud and courageous women who are no longer victims, but healers, builders, and liberators. When you give women power, you are assuring the progress of humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Our third panelist today is Pamela Down, department head and associate professor in the Department of Archaeology and Anthropology at the University of Saskatchewan. As a medical anthropologist, Pamela's work focuses primarily on the health-related implications and repercussions of local and migrant sex work, gender-based violence and globalization, HIV AIDS and hepatitis C, syndemic theory, and motherhood and maternal health. She has partnered with over 20 government-based and non-governmental organizations across six countries to pursue these ideas. More recently, Pamela's Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council funded research was based in the Eastern Caribbean, where she worked with the Chronic Disease Research Center and several community organizations in Barbados to explore the cultural and human rights responses to community change. She's currently working with AIDS Saskatoon on a three-year Canadian Institutes of Health Research funded project on mothering in the context of HIV AIDS. Pamela is the author of the book Picadura de la Mosca Chiclera that offers an examination of leishmaniasis and social inequality and co-editor of the interdisciplinary reader Gendered Intersections. She has published numerous journal articles and book chapters, the majority of which are grounded in community-based and participatory research. Pamela is a fellow of the Society for Applied Anthropology and the recipient of three University of Saskatchewan Teaching Excellent Excellence Awards. Welcome, Professor Down. Thank you. Your Excellency, President McKinnon, colleagues and guests, it is an honor to be on this panel today and I want to extend my thanks to the organizers uh, for having me here. The opportunity to participate in this discussion is indeed a privilege because of the unparalleled, important and enduring work that Her Excellency has done in the area of women's rights. As a professor and researcher, first in the Department of Women's and Gender Studies and now in Archaeology and Anthropology, I firmly believe that few topics hold greater relevance to our world than this. If I were to give a title to the brief comments I'm going to make today, it would be simply viewpoints from the ground, and I'll be taking up very specifically the topic of the fragility of women's rights. As an anthropologist, I work at a very local and micro level. It is not that the community-based dynamics I study are not connected in important ways to the kind of legislative, historical, and transnational context that Professors Bilson and Jordan have so eloquently spoken of. Indeed, they are, and it is certainly incumbent on anthropologists to explore those connections in significant and detailed ways. But our primary point of reference is the locally lived daily lives of women, men, and children. And the record that has emerged from these local level studies across cultural contexts shows that stories of human rights violations circulate with tremendous salience in marginalized communities of all kinds. Human rights violations, including gendered violence, forced uprootedness and displacement, estrangeness, estrangement from homelands, poverty, discrimination, and limited or no access to health care. These violations are not abstract ideas, but they are realities that are lived, and then they are relived through the stories that circulate in often frightening ways. This certainly holds true for the work that I've done with migrant sex workers and trafficked women and girls in the Caribbean, Central America, and Western Canada. It is also true for the women with whom I'm currently working several kilometers over the bridge in a project based at AIDS Saskatoon. These are women who are mothers living with the risks and realities of addiction, injection drug use, poverty, HIV, and hepatitis C. For all these women, and throughout the 20-some years that this work represents, stories of sexual assault and fear abound. 
This, these stories are perhaps told more than any others, and they speak to the seemingly unrelenting ubiquity of sexualized violence that marks the lives of far too many women and girls in the world. Rape, incest, abuse, abduction, disappearance, and coercion are common elements in these stories. Lost dignity and desperation result. There are few havens of safety for a 14-year-old girl who travels by force from her home island of Trinidad to Barbados to work the burgeoning sex tourist markets. She is in the country illegally. She faces challenges of addiction, sleep deprivation, and chronic injury. And she is under the watchful eye of several men who demand the money she makes and in return provide her with insecure and temporary housing, inadequate food, uh, unsafe drugs, and equipment. Seeking help from officials such as the police or healthcare practitioners is an unavailable option for this young woman. The picture is dismal at best. And yet, amidst these human rights violations, this same girl, who is not a fictional character but a participant in the four-year study I conducted, exerts considerable agency in forging informal alliances and friendships with others. Friendships that endure long periods of separation and serve as sources of strength, support, and resilience. A very similar pattern has emerged with the mothers who access the services of AIDS Saskatoon. In the context of HIV and hepatitis C, these women struggle to care for their children, many of whom are no longer in their custody. The vast majority are First Nations and Métis, and they share a history of colonial displacement, disenfranchisement, racism, and fear but most commonly they tell stories of sexual violation. As poignant as these women's stories of sexual assault and violation are, and they certainly are, they offer equally poignant portraits of friendships, informal connections that they too forge out of largely a similar history. They have shared understandings of the challenges they face and they are left feeling anything but alone. The view from the ground of vulnerability and violence a ground that is too often hidden from those with privilege and unquestioned entitlement, provides a front row seat to human rights violation. But it is from this seat that we also get a glimpse of resilience, friendship, and resourcefulness. What would happen if stories of sexual assault and violation that circulate as public secrets, and privately whispered and widely heard, could be supplanted by stories of human rights vindications instead? What if there was the political will to capitalize on the informal resources and sources of resilience and support to create a reality that gives rise to stories of friendship rather than fear? And what if the participants in my research with, the <coughs> with adequate social support and legal protections could engender a life of possibility where child apprehension, vulnerability to violence, and everyday illnesses were the exceptions rather than the rules? Progress towards these what-if scenarios are most certainly being made through the legislative advancements that have occurred through the last 50 years and that we are here to celebrate. Women who face the greatest marginalization are forging paths towards empowerment. I hope that in 20 years, 10 years, if I were to be on a panel such as this again, the answers to these questions would constitute my contribution to this very important discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Our fourth panelist today is Omiya Subat, president of the Graduate Students Association at the University of Saskatchewan. Omiya Su is the Cree daughter of poet Louise Half, author of Bare Bones and Feathers, Blue Marrow and the Crooked Good, and Dr. Peter Butt, Northern Medical Services. She was raised in Meadow Lake in Saskatoon, where she now attends the University of Saskatchewan as a doctoral candidate in Indigenous history. Omiya Su has worked as a community research facilitator for the Indigenous People's Health Research Center and has held internships at the Dominion Institute, the Canadian Museum of Civilization, and the Department of Foreign Affairs. She has had the fortune of being mentored by many different people along the way. Omiya Su completed her Master's of Arts at the University of Ottawa with Métis historian Professor Nicole Saint-Ange on the life ways of First Nations people in northwestern Saskatchewan during the fur trade era. Omiya Su is now the University of Saskatchewan Graduate Students Association President for the 2010-11 term. Her current research is focused on indigenous architecture and how architecture fundamentally shapes and reflects our human values. Welcome. Okay, 
Um, bienvenue, Doal, good morning. Excellency, distinguished panel, and venerable audience members, I am extremely honored to be amongst you and given such a friendly reception as a member of this panel. For this presentation, I have consulted my personal policy, which looks something like this. <coughs> Consultation with elders, mother, best friend, professors, books, articles, and ultimately your personal life. <coughs> Western Shoshone elder Norman Cavanaugh said, for the beginning of life, there has to be a woman. If it weren't for women, there would be no leaders of either sex. My sky dancing poet mother, Louise Half said, women are at the beginning. They bring enlightenment from darkness as, as we all pass through the life source that is her body. My best friend, Ruby DeHond, activist and lawyer said, the glass ceiling is hardening. With all of our increased education, women continue to make less than men in Canada, which is also markedly disproportionate for women with disabilities, women of color, and lower income women. Every four minutes, one in four women is abused in Canada. Professor Marcia Gallo at the University of Nevada told me about Emma Goldman, an early 20th century radical feminist anarchist who distrusted government and believed that the real feminist challenge was to reform a government that did not fundamentally reflect local human needs. Through reading the introductory book by Kristen Rowe Finkbeiner, The F Word, Feminism in Jeopardy, Women, Politics, and the Future, I came to understand the growth of feminism in the United States, and most importantly, how feminism, a simple concept simply denoting equality between men and women, like many political movements, fell to the vagaries of division amongst women over sexuality, motherhood, and the inability of the movement to capture women of all races, abilities, and incomes. How do we encompass all of these diverse interests into one unified feminist movement and gain the support of men along the way? Well, lucky for us, it has been quite simply summarized by Her Excellency, women's rights are human's rights. If we accept that feminism is simply equality, then how many human rights can we address that will bring not only all colors of women together, but also all races of men? Not only able-bodied women, not only educated women, not only well-paid women, and all men who correspond to their intelligence, their drive, and their physicality, and all women. We have all heard the Cheyenne proverb, a nation is not conquered until the hearts of its women are on the ground. Then it is done, no matter how brave its warriors or strong its weapons. However, this proverb is not simply a fable of violence, the violence of men and of their physical violence against women. It is also a metaphor. No matter how strong men may be, if women are prevented from being who they are in the fullest sense, if they are prevented from working equally, sometimes separately, but always equally, with men, if men forget that women are the backbone of the nation, that nation will not live another day in its full splendor, its natural fertility, enlightenment, and ultimately in balance with the beauty of life. Thus, women's rights are human rights. Feminism means equality, and equality means that it is not only men who stand to gain from basic necessities like clean drinking water, food, a living wage, access to a full range of health care and sexual liberty, but also women, and thus the entire nation. In Canada, I would go further. We have an opportunity to embrace our birthright as a nation. That is, to acknowledge our Aboriginal ancestry and current existence, to honour the many wonderful legacies that being an Aboriginal nation entails including an acknowledgement of the power inherent in equality between men and women. If we were to appreciate our Aboriginal roots and push our nation toward its potential, we would further embrace true democracy and universal post-secondary education. After all, what is a human life if not for the freedom to make our own decisions? And what kind of human life can we expect if those decisions are uninformed? What is democracy if citizens do not participate equally? 
An educated society is one that uses all of its senses, including its mind, its heart, sight, sound, feel, smell, taste, man, woman. A vibrant nation opens its mind and heart to the many possibilities that its citizens can offer and chooses the medicines that at that time best suits the whole body. If we are to truly decolonize our great nation, we will heal that body, not just those parts that we think represent sickness. After all, Derek Thompson, another thoughtful friend of mine, has said, it is not just Aboriginal people suffering the effects of colonization that must be healed, but it is truly a sick society that willfully subjects entire peoples to the dehumanizing effects of mental, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. Old men, old women, middle-aged adults, youth, babies, Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal, immigrants recent and long past, we are all in this country together, and we must seek, seek new ways to bring the whole body of the nation to health and fulfillment. Voter turnout for the federal election in 2008 was the lowest ever recorded. Youth are the least likely to vote. However, interestingly, Elections Canada did not examine female participation in numbers. What they did acknowledge is that France and the UK are facing similar voter disinterest, which tells me that again, Canada has an opportunity to lead a global revolution in engaging citizens in democracy, and here in Canada, a truly Indigenous democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Omiya Sue, and thank you to all of our panelists this morning. We'll now open the floor to questions from the audience. Um, please, if you've got a question, uh, raise your hand, and we have runners along the side, I think, that have uh, microphones that will be able to uh, bring them to you. Actually, uh, if you want to just go to the outer aisles, um, we'll be able to uh, pick up your questions there. Um, and we have time for a few questions this morning. Um, We'll, ask, we'll answer the questions, uh, we'll address the questions in the order that they're asked. And um, I would like to thank you in advance for making sure we can hear um, as many questions from our uh, participants today as possible. So our first question. Oh, I was, I was hoping it would be ladies first. Um, I have uh, a, a mute point in this entire process of uh, being born in a male body in Canada. Um, Human rights and women's rights are the same thing. So men's rights, which I've never seen written down, uh, mean that they're inhuman. Uh, and I'm talking about syntax and language, but that's what it's all about. There's been a process that's starting to bother me that's been rising, and I first noticed it in uh, George Orwell and Animal Farm about the establishment of things on paper. And then Shirley MacLaine wrote a book called uh, Out on a Leash, and she started bringing up the <laughs> dividing line being micturation or urination. And there was a process which was starting to occur, which finally resolved in the Swedish parliament, I believe, that said that it was a determinant factor that the male process of urination being done in an upright manner was seen as an act of aggression. So now that we've got a, a tinge towards a chariot law uh, to bring this beyond, say, politics into religion, whereupon uh, an eye for an eye in the fifth century belief of that process occurs, does it mean to say that we can f expect as males to reach a point of intimidation where if we were to stand and urinate and me being stand here and not peeing into the wind, um, I could expect to be genetically, or geni genetically mutilated for doing so? Would one of our panelists like to uh, respond to that? <laughs> I don't think that this discussion is about domination, but rather it's about equality, um, equality between bodies, between work, and um, between men and women. It's not about domination today. Thank you for your question. Thank you. We've got another question up in the balcony.
Presently, there's over 600 Aboriginal women missing or presumed missing within Canada and God knows how many non-Aboriginal women. And yet the government has no strategy to address these missing women, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, or a department that has been set up in order to look for these women because Lord knows we have a lot of families out there still looking for their nieces, their moms, their daughters, and their sisters. What does the government plan to do and what should we do in order to be able to address this issue? not a representative of the government so other than I work at a publicly funded university but uh, so I really can't speak to uh, what initiatives or what um, plans they they have for dealing with this I concur completely that I think it is one of the most pressing social issues of our time uh, in 2001 I did work uh, here locally in Saskatoon with a group of young women who were involved in systems of prostitution and sex work and I became very close with one of the young women. She was 15 years old. Uh, in some of the things that I've written, I refer, she chose the pseudonym for herself, Ashley Mika. She was an engaging and lovely young woman. She would laugh easily and often. She's the kind of young woman who would put you immediately at ease and would welcome you to talk about your life. And she was happy and enthusiastic to talk about hers. Her real name now circulates on that list of missing women. Uh, we have looked far, long, and hard for her. And you're right, the list keeps compiling over and over again. I do know that the uh, Canadian government has funded research into exploring the social reverberations of this issue. But in terms of remedying it, I think it is something that we should demand to our public officials remains at the top of a priority list and to push them for exactly what it is you are asking. I wish I had the answer to that question. Thank you, Professor Dow. <laughs> have another question. Thank you, President McKinnon, the panel. And uh, I, I, have, uh, I am an artist with human rights, which is based in Durban. South Africa is international. And we take our images all over the world dealing with human rights, human rights. And I love what I hear here today. Uh, my, my question to the panel here as like uh, with Governor General story, it remind me of mine too. My mother put education first. We choose Canada as our new home, coming from Egypt, uh, because of Canada philosophy of uh, Prime Minister Pearson uh, and the UN place in the Middle East and in the world. Coming to Canada, we put our education uh, like me and my husband and my daughter are professionals, educator. But I would say after 9-11, there is a change in terms of targeting, targeting certain ethnic groups in Canada. Even the title of visible minority, I, I find it is not suitable because we we define, define it by, uh, by our feature. No, I, I am against that. But anyway, after the event of 9-11, uh, Arab, f I mean, Canadian from Arab descent have been targeting, including Maher Arar and so many others. So I feel my Canadianship is kind of shaking who I am. And when you're talking about it, the government policy, but also in academic institution like ours, like the University of Sach Saskatchewan, we start, like I put all, we put our, all our efforts, I'm getting emotional, all our efforts in education. I'm a lecturer, my husband was professor, and my daughter is a professor too at the college here. But after 9-11, we start seeing difference in the policies of the university because of our ethnic background in terms of CISA, in terms of the university action to protect us from that. So I would like to hear from you how the, what the university stand for in terms of your academi academic freedom, your job, and what is the bigger picture which is taking on 
in terms of the Canadian po uh, policies toward uh, Arab descent. Even they are Canadian. Like coming to this country is uh, like uh, Governor General's story. My mother was uh, the power for my education. I and my husband put all our efforts in our daughter education, assuming like we still the immigrant, but she's a real Canadian, but she targeted by Caesar, and this is happened if reflected or affected her academic uh, profession on campus here. So I would like to see how the academic freedom is. She's a woman, she's academic, but her ethnic background affected her career. Thank you. Professor Jordan, I think uh, you wanted to respond to that. Well, I can say, based on my participation in, in this community, that men and women here on faculty try our best to, in our, in our everyday teaching, to inculcate those values of human rights. And uh, that's one reason why I, I teach courses on genocide and mass killing, where we talk about issues about uh, discrimination, uh, the causes of structural violence in society, and um, the, uh, the fact that racial profiling can be very damaging to individuals and damaging to our, our own sense of what it means to be Canadian. Uh, so all I, I can say is based on my, my own experiences here, and I felt that as a teacher I've, I've had um, freedom of expression in my classes, that the students who take classes here, uh, specifically um, what I know of uh, in genocide studies, uh, are very interested in this topic as well, and they're, they're educating themselves in order to be tolerant um, as adults and in order be, to be accepting of the multicultural aspects of our Canadian um, politics and of our Canadian sense of identity. So um, those of us on campus who, who teach and who are our staff members, I think on the whole, are sensitive to these issues. And we wanna know what's happening and we wanna be able to address any of these problems as soon as possible. Thank you, Professor Jordan. Thank you. And I'd like to invite the audience, please, to join me in thanking all of our panelists today for their participation in this morning's program. <laughs> Beth Bilson. <laughs> Beth Bilson, Acting Dean, College of Law. Pamela Jordan, Associate Professor, Department of History. Pamela Down, Department Head and Associate Professor, Department of Archaeology and Anthropology, and Omiya Subat, President of the Graduate Students Association. To conclude the discussion of Women's Rights Are Human Rights, I would like to invite Her Excellency to return to the podium, if she chooses, to offer some closing remarks. Madam Jean. First, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Beth Bilson, uh, Ms. Jordan, Pamela Jordan, Pamela Down, Omisa Omeyasu Bhatt for uh, their wonderful, wonderful and, and, and meaningful contribution to this discussion. Please, another round of applause. I sat there taking notes, and uh, I look forward to other opportunities for us to get together, and I'm sure you, you, you would say the same, and, and to listen to you, to your experience, your perspectives. Uh, let's not call these closing remarks, because I think we need to keep the space for, for this uh, reflection and, and this uh, dialogue and conversation open as much as possible. Um, I'd like to, to maybe answer to uh, the issue of uh, strategies to address uh, the tragic uh, situation of missing women, and the number is, is, is uh, just unbearable. Um, 
even if there were just two, it would be unbearable. Um, I think uh, one important uh, strategy is to make sure that we can break down the indifference. To, so to break down the silence and not just see this, uh, uh, the situation as, as, as statistics, uh, but to to continue to uh, to uh, uh, come forward with the human dimension of of this critical situation, how come women can disappear in our country? How can we lose track of women? And uh, what I we can imagine of what what probably have m have happened to them is 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 uh, disturbing. It is disturbing. So we cannot just we can we cannot let this you know uh, be um, uh, comment dirait-on uh, we cannot let this fall in 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 silence and, and turn the page and say okay um, yes horrendous uh, stories but uh, well no answers no answers we 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 feel totally powerless. So um, we need to uh, to connect to these stories to re to keep you know uh, to to relate to them uh, as if uh, one of these women were were uh, our sisters, our mothers, and 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 say this cannot uh, this cannot happen and should not happen in our country. So breaking down the indifference and you know the problem with indifference is that it it. Uh, it also creates so many situations of, of so many solitudes, and that's probably one of the, of the reasons why I, I chose uh, breaking down solitudes as, as my motto, because I think uh, the most dra dramatic uh, uh, situations in our country and in the world today are related to the many solitudes uh, in, our, in our world and uh, in our society, and uh, we need to address these realities. Uh, yesterday, um, I joined uh, at uh, uh, more than 150 young people um, at a youth center, IGAT, who actually shared with us uh, their stories. And um, some of them were very difficult to hear. And we were talking about realities happening here in the city and here in Canada, and I must say that it wasn't, these stories were very uh, similar to other stories that I had heard in other places in our, uh, in, in our country, other cities, other communities. And they were all stories of distress and again of solitudes, of solitudes. So um, I think uh, uh, having, um, a commitment, making a commitment to breaking down the silence and the indifference is, uh, should be a shared responsibility. We should all leave this room saying, okay, I have also a role to play. I have a responsibility to raise questions and to go from words to actions and to force actions. Um, I, um, I, I believe in um, what uh, universities like this one are, are providing as uh, spaces for thoughts, dialogue, and, uh, and uh, I would say collective um, opportunities for us to engage with one another. Um, and that's why I always feel so, so comfortable and, 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 and excited to, to find myself uh, in uh, uh, a space like this one. And I want to thank the University of Saskatchewan for providing this space. Um, in order to raise awareness and uh, to really invest in that very, very uh, crucial uh, uh, 
uh, time uh, that we spend together just reflecting together. Um, uh, sir, I, I just want to uh, maybe answer your question. I, there's no reason for men to feel intimidated or to feel that uh, there is prob probably a strategy of intimidation when women speak out. I think history has showed that um, in every struggle when women fought for more justice and equality, it was in the benefit of the greater good and in a very inclusive manner. So uh, this is, we don't want, I don't think that there's any intention in women's endeavors to reproduce situations of domination. Uh, there's, uh, there's a definite will, really, to contribute to uh, building a better world and to contribute to humanity. And for this, I think it's very important to see women and men working together. And it is happening. It is happening, and it is a blessing. Um, and this, this is how we are defining you know, our ways of living together. Because otherwise, uh, I would say domination is so uh, destructive, and more than that, so boring. <laughs> <laughs> I think we are trying to raise our children, boys and girls, um, with more self-confidence, knowing that we have so much to, to share and uh, to build together. This is what we are doing. And um, as parents, fathers and mothers know that. And uh, this is the kind of, uh, I think, um, uh, vision that we need to, to work on together. There should be more celebrations like this one. Um, I want to tell you that uh, the last five years have been so exciting. It's been a wonderful journey. Uh, because we are a, countries of, a country of so many possibilities, so many opportunities. And uh, there's one thing that um, we like to say, is that uh, we Canadians are very humble. Uh, I think that um, we certainly need to be more daring. Uh, daring in, in continuing to always look for for solutions and for answers. We like to say that um, our dream is an unfinished, an unfinished one. And uh, what I like about us is that we have the courage of confronting history together, looking at uh, the challenges that we confront together and always continuing to look for solutions together. This is where our strength is. There's one thing very important that is happening in our country right now, and it has to do also with our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I believe that uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, that will really travel across the country is a great opportunity that we need to seize. It's an opportunity really for us all, Aboriginals and non-Aboriginals, to come together, to confront history together, to heal together, because we have all been deprived in different ways by the system of a forced assimilation that came with the residential schools. Um, 
there's a healing process that has to be a collective one. It's not an Aboriginal issue, it's a Canadian issue. And I would like to see all of us together, again, Aboriginals and non-Aboriginals, come together and reflect upon how we want to live together. It is time for us to do this. There are situations happening in our country that are just not acceptable. I'm sorry to say that we are not equal in this country. We have a dream about equality, but we're not. We want equal opportunities for all. We need to be... Um, I was... Uh, I had the opportunity to participate in the first session in Winnipeg at the Forks. What happened was uh, quite magic. We cried together, sharing the difficult stories. The pain at times was difficult, unbearable, but we also look at solutions and at ways to overcome that pain together. I think that if we seize this opportunity, we will be a stronger nation, a very strong one. It is time. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. As our time with the Governor General draws to a close, I'd like to call on our Chancellor, Vera Pezer, to thank Her Excellency. Chancellor? On behalf of our governing and administrative bodies, faculty, staff, and especially our students, thank you, Your Excellency, for coming to the University of Saskatchewan. In addition to your rank as Governor General, Today you brought and shared with us your well-known enthusiasm for and your lifelong commitment to human rights, women, and youth. Our university, like others, exists to create and share knowledge. Our important responsibilities are to encourage innovative thought and promote positive actions. We have much to consider as we reflect on the substance of your address and subsequent panel discussion with our faculty and students. As Canadians, we can be proud of our contributions in the area of human rights, but as we've learned this morning, much more remains to be done. Our decency, dedication, collaborative nature, and perhaps a decision to be a little more daring, will serve us well as we continue to work together to build a better future. Excellency, Thank you for making this day so memorable for all of us at the University of Saskatchewan. Would you please join me in thanking the Governor General of Canada. Thank you, Chancellor Pezer. Colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, please rise as Her Excellency, the Right Honourable Mikhail Jean,
Governor General of Canada departs the room. <laughs>